Uh, what I want to do is talk specifically about one aspect that I've wrestled with and continue to, to, to think about, which is the Uncanny Valley. I also was want to, I almost wanted to title this talk um, a little differently, uh, a robot as metaphor. Because I think that a lot of what we're talking about and the way we build these robots and the kind of things we're exploring is really raising a metaphorical question. That the robot is really a representation of ourselves and in a new form. And I think that this is, raises a, a deeply personal and human uh, questions. And I think that's why many people resonate with, with artworks that involve robots. Uh, I want to also say that everything I'm going to talk about is collaborative. So all of my projects in, it have been collaborative with a, uh, a growing group of wonderful uh, colleagues and, uh, and collaborators. Um, for, for someone who doesn't, may not be familiar with the idea of the uncanny, how many of you are familiar with uncanny? All right, not the uncanny valley, but uncanny itself, the roots of uncanny. OK, just a few. So I wasn't either. And part of it is I had to go back and um, learn about this. And it goes back to this essay uh, almost 200 years ago. Um, Hoffman wrote this, uh, this story uh, called The Sandman. And it, it, it figures a, there's an automaton um, that plays a central role. And it turns out that uh, Sigmund Freud uh, picks up on this a century later and writes an essay about the uncanny. And it's about, it's very rich. It's a very complex essay. I encourage you to read it. It's only about 20 pages. But people say it is the most, it is the most uncanny of Freud's um, uh, articles. And it's really Freud's aesthetics. But the way he writes it almost as an uncanny exploration in itself. It's, it, there are volumes written about this. It's very interesting. What uncanny really um, the word is very funny, too. They're, even the word is uncanny. So, heimlich, unheimlich. And forgive me all the German speakers here. I, I'm butchering it. But heimlich means familiar. Um, and unheimlich means unfamiliar. So, uh, unheimlich was meant to, to, was translated into English as uncanny uh, after Freud's essay. Which is weird because, for me, uh, canny actually comes from the word ten. Um, so, that has another resonance. Um, but here's a way of thinking about it. Deja vu, we all know, is the experience uh, when you see something strange, but it seems strange. It seems familiar. You've been there before. Uncanny is like the inverse of that. Uncanny is where you see something familiar, but it seems strange to you, strangely odd. And um, if you, the examples are there's many examples, and one of them in the in, is uh, that was very common is uh, vampires, right? And this is. You know, perennially fascinating. We have a huge appetite uh, for vampire stories, and because these vampires are they're, they're they're human, but they're not human, right? They're right at this borderline. Another example is is zombies. We all love zombies. Again, perennial favorite, and they also have this quality. We're not sure um, whether the the person is uh, is a zombie or not. And a famous um, Blade Runner example in Blade Runner, we have um, the uh, replicants, right? And there's this question of how the empathy test plays a central role. How do we decide if this person is uh, an, a, um, a human or not? And, uh, and of course, this figures into what we're talking about here today, which is robots. Because these, again, are oftentimes um, uh, at the borderline. Now, what happened a few years recently, um, now 40 years ago, uh, was um, Masahiro Mori was working in Tokyo. And he was um, thinking about something very different. He was um, interested in making, um, he was a roboticist, but he was interested in making um, prosthetics. And he was looking at prosthetic hands, prosthetic legs, and he said there's a problem because if the hand or the leg looks too um, similar to human, people kind of get uh, uh, repulsed by it. It looks too, too, too familiar. So he said, he posited this beautiful thing. He said, like, let's, let's plot this on a, on a chart, not, not a linear axis or a um, uh, numerical axis, but just conceptually that if we start making things um, more human-like, you know, we, we get, it, it, there's an appealing aspect for a while, and then um, at a certain point, um, so, but, you know, there, this is very appealing, we like um, Astro Boy, but if we go too far, and others have alluded to Ishiguru, who I believe is the master of the uncanny, uncanny valley, um, uh, it, it starts to really, you know, have an eerie effect. We get a little freaked out. Right? And so um, what's going on here? And so um, what uh, Masahiro Mori said was, well, what happens is if you get too human at a certain point, you actually, the likability, the, the, 
the sort of acceptance goes way down. And we enter this, what he called the uncanny, he, he didn't call it the uncanny valley, by the way. He just said it was a valley. And it was in Japanese, his article. He said there was a valley here. Um, but then if we push beyond it, we get back into the realm of, of real humans that we like. Um, but he, he characterized this. And, um, and the essay, the essay was, um, was read by many people. But um, here's another example of, this is, by the way, is not, not a real baby. It's a, it's, a, it's a new breed of like super lifelike dolls that um, are very popular among certain class of women who carry them around and I don't know. Um, but uh, my point is <clears throat> that uh, Yaziel Reinhardt made this connection in 1978 between the word uncanny, Freud's idea, and uh, Maury's Valley. She put those two together. Very interesting because Maury did not know about Sigmund Freud. In fact, in, a, in, a, in an IROS conference um, three or four years ago, we had Maury here, and he, 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 he basically confirmed that he had never heard of Freud. So he wasn't thinking about the, Freud's notion of uncanny, but he was thinking about something very analogous, and Yasia Reinhardt correctly, I believe, called it the uncanny valley. Now, the uncanny valley is fascinating for um, designers, but also for artists. So, I, and I, I think that we can characterize a lot of what um, artworks uh, on, on what artists do as exploring the uncanny valley. So Stellark, who's really sort of spiritually in the room with us, who was very much a part of the book, and um, and if you look at his works, and some of, we saw some of them earlier today, he really gets this. I mean, he plays with this at a very deep level. Um, you know, this is just one of his examples, but if you look at his works, uh, it resonates very strongly, and he's, he's, he's exploring, he's playing with it, and he's trying to sort of essentially have that resonate for um, his audiences as well. All right, so I'll just mention my, one of my projects, which is Telegarden, or a couple of my projects. The Telegarden was, um, a, uh, was an installation we, we, we put out, out in um, January, or no, August of 1995, and we, we set the robot in the center of a, a real uh, garden, and then we put this online on the web. So the web was just somewhat new in 95. This was the early browser, HTML um, mosaic browser. But uh, you could interact with it by clicking. And so it was like a, a webcam, but it had one extra feature, which was that um, you could participate. So if you, if you visited for a while, you, were, you could register, you would get a password, and then you could participate by watering the garden. In fact, after you watered for a little while, you could also then, we were granted you first seed. So you were able to plant in the garden as well. And, and I'm, I'm not sure, but we, there was a conjecture that this was the first um, uh, telerobot on the web. It was the first time you could actually activate something rather than just view. So webcams had existed before, but this was the first um, where you could activate and uh, change the world. For us, one thing that was really important was this, um, this question of the, uh, the physicality of a garden. Because a garden, after all, is very resonant for um, humans going back to uh, biblical references in the garden. Um, and there were many issues that came up. Like, for example, anyone who's a gardener knows that if you start growing a garden where you have thousands of people coming in from online, um, and what happened in our case was it quickly grew completely out of control and it became really an exercise in the tragedy of the commons. Um, but one other thing that came up was the question of the status of the garden. Was there, in fact, a garden at all? And a, uh, it was raised in an email to me uh, by a student, and he said, how do I know there's a garden? And I have to admit, it was me, caught me by surprise, because I wasn't, it was so obvious we were working with this garden, but I realized from his perspective, how could he know? He's over the, the web and trying to interact with something, and it, it could have been um, faked, essentially. And, uh, and really the question is that this distinction between virtual reality um, where you have a fictional reality, but it's, it looks real, and distal reality, where there's a real, something real, but it's distant or mediated. And I think that this, this was a question that became increasingly interesting to me, and I think it's even more acute today because the, 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 the boundary between these two things is becoming um, increasingly uh, blurry because, as virtual reality and other systems get more sophisticated. Well, at that time, we, I worked with a philosopher, uh, Hubert Dreyfus, and some other colleagues, and we um, put together this book that was, um, we called, uh, we, we coined this term, uh, telepistemology, 
uh, the, not, the issue, the, the question of knowledge at a distance. Um, and the, the term never caught on. Um, but, uh, but the book is available, and it, it, it has um, essays by artists and engineers and, uh, and philosophers. Um, and then it led us to thinking about other projects. Like we started thinking, well, if people are interested in coming to a garden and spending time, uh, maybe they would look, could we take that up a notch and, and have them go into a social environment? And we even thought it was some practical, practical re uh, advantage because like, if you wanted to have people come into the White House, oh, back in the day when people wanted to go to the White House, um, um, <clears throat> you couldn't have, have everybody come in, but you could imagine that you could have one uh, uh, person, a, a robot, come in. And then other people could, could watch uh, over the web, like the, the telegarden. But we didn't want to try and get a... Um, a robot into, an, into a social environment because of all the reasons that you all know is that uh, you, know, you have all kinds of mechanical challenges. So we finessed that by saying, well, let's have a human do it where the human will wear uh, some gear so that they could um, essentially be like a robot. And this plays another little inversion on this question. But, so this was our design, and we took this in. Uh, we designed a, um, an interface. So this is from the web, what you would see here. You're essentially looking through the eyes of the of the teleactor, and they're moving around, and the teledirectors are online giving instruction. And it's not just one person driving, but it's many people driving simultaneously. That's the, that was the core idea to this collaborative um, interaction. And we were really interested in seeing, like, how would that play out? Well, one of the things we really hit on very early, we discovered, was that um, people were not that happy <laughs> with this. Not, not, um, we, we thought, oh, you know, it's so wonderful for the teledirectors, because they get to go into some environment. But it was the people in the environment who were unnerved by the presence of this teleactor because they were like, who are you, what are you doing? And why are you wearing this camera and who's watching me? So I want to, um, I want to make a distinction between, I think this is, very, this is relevant to the uncanny issue, and I want to make a distinction between the, what we might call the representational uncanny, that's where you have something that looks lifelike um, but may not be, and the experiential uncanny, that's where you experience something that gives you that same creepy feeling. Um, legal Tender was another project uh, that we, 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 we developed. Um, I won't go into detail on this because I'm just watching the time, but it was based on the Stanley Milgram experiments where people were applying shocks to um, what they thought was uh, people who were uh, in a laboratory and they, they gave them very high voltages. Um, we decided to do something um, somewhat analogous in the realm of the web where you would visit a site and you were given two... Uh, image of $200 bills, and you were given a sample from one of them, a sector you were assigned to, and you, and you were given the opportunity to choose one experiment to perform on the $100 bill. And interestingly, almost everyone, given these choices, chose the thermal test, which was to essentially burn a hole in the bill to, uh, to ascertain its veracity. And um, as soon as you chose that, we would then present you with a reminder that it's a federal law burning or defacing uh, federal currency, and that we had already gotten your email address, so now you were asked, do you understand and wish to proceed? So there was a little echo of Milgram there. And uh, we wanted to just play with this idea of, again, creeping people out in a uh, constructive way. Um, but it raises the same uh, actual versus virtual questions. All right, so um, the, the last one I want to mention is this one, where Freud also, in this essay, talks about um, the idea that something gets revealed um, it's about repression, and, um, and, and this is where some, he has this idea that it, the uncanny gets triggered when you suddenly feel you're sitting somewhere and you feel like someone's watching you. You get this hairs on the back of your neck stand up. And then it's, it's relevant to, I think, surveillance, and increasingly an issue today. And so we build a project called Demonstrate. This was right around the time of the, um, after 9-11, and there was a lot of... Um, uh, new, new cameras and homeland security and, and, and sort of yielding of, um, of privacy rights in regard that the government was starting to, um, was starting to mandate. And of course there's CCTV. Uh, by the way, I think these are issues are only more um, prevalent today. Uh, what we did was we set up a camera at Berkeley and it was just a commercial camera. Um, right here is a uh, Panasonic camera. In fact, I'm delighted that uh, Des Song is uh, here. Is, he, was, uh, he was a graduate student at the time and worked closely with me on this project. Um, this shows you what the camera could see if you could pan and tilt it and stitch it all together. 
So we placed it over the, um, the student um, Sproul Plaza, a famous place where all the students had protested. Um, as we're actually seeing this coming week, will be replayed as the uh, free speech uh, movement, uh, free speech week goes into play. Um, but we put this camera up there, and here's the thing, we wanted to, um, we did it at the anniversary of the free speech movement, 40th anniversary, and over the same, this is the same Sproul Plaza, um, but this time we, we wanted to raise another question, which is we wanted people to now have the opportunity to zoom in on the plaza and observe 24 hours a day. And not only that, but you could observe and capture images. Now one thing that was kind of fun was that we had this way of using, um, having multiple people share control of the camera, which was part of Des's PhD thesis. Um, but that was sort of the technical interesting aspect, but the um, artistic aspect was we wanted to see how this would play out for the human participants. Now by the way, the camera is very powerful. This is a commercially available camera. This is how it looks at the, at the uh, unzoomed level. This is the more zoomed in levels. So this is medium range, and this is the close up. Now, most people are like, oh, you know, surprised, but it's amazing that you, these cameras are now increasingly inexpensive and they're all over the place. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if there's one in this room. What was interesting for us is that we were now able to let people access to this. So anyone could be in the role of a surveillance um, uh, um, uh, agent, and they could take pictures at any time of the night and then post them in this database. And so this started taking off, and it got, um, it got a fair amount of activity until I was called into the principal's office. But the, ch the chancellor basically called me in. And basically was like, what the hell are you doing? And um, to make a long story short, it turns out that it's actually illegal <laughs> in the state of California to have such a camera because it violates a paparazzi law that had been uh, if, it initiated after uh, Princess Diana's death. So we had a whole meeting about this. He said, but you're, you are addressing the free speech movement, the free speech issue of our time namely surveillance. And so he said, I want the project to continue, but I want you to, to make sure the camera can't look out outside of campus. As long as it was on campus, he said it was okay. Um, so I can tell you more about those aspects, but I just want to come back to this, this distinction this, or the, um, the sort of relationship between the representation uncanny and the experiential uncanny, because this question about um, being watched, yeah, I think, is at the, uh, at the core of it. So more on this, we, um, Elizabeth Yakum and I did a paper, wrote a, wrote a chapter on this, that's in the book um, that we're, we're here discussing. And uh, we have a lot more of um, other examples and stories about these um, this issues. Um, I, wanna, I wanna, last time, in the few minutes I have left, I wanna show you a short video. Um, but this is, uh, this, is, this is, on the right is, is, is the phenomenon that happened a few years later, which is, uh, of course, we're all familiar with Google Glass. And um, it's interesting because Google Glass, um, triggers the same exact response, right? So, and, and, and that's why we don't see Google Glass out there anymore. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, this, let me play this short video. I love thinking about this kind of stuff. And you know who else loves thinking about this kind of stuff? My husband, Ken, because he's a professor of robotics. Hey. Hey. So Ken, what is this all about? Why are we creating technologies that are getting more and more creepy? Well, as our technologies become more sophisticated, they're becoming more and more lifelike. And that triggers a primitive reflex in us because we know it's not human, but it's too close. Which is uncomfortable and kind of creepy. Exactly. And there's a word for this. They call it the uncanny. The uncanny. And it's not just technologies that trigger this reflex. It's all sorts of things that are close to being human, but aren't. Like wax figures, dolls, robots, or zombies. So it's like our body's response that warns you, pay extra attention. This might not be what it seems. <laughs> and the things that trigger this reflex fall into two categories. The first has to do with things that are lifelike. Is this thing real or is it artificial? That distinction has to be really clear or else we get creeped out. Like those reborner dolls I just found out about that are way too lifelike and very creepy. Right. And the uncanny explains that classic example of cartoon characters. Animators have learned that they can't make the eyes too realistic or they'll make us uncomfortable. Cartoons can't be too human. And the second category of things that trigger this reflex is surveillance. What do you mean? 
Well, you know that that creepy feeling you sometimes get when you feel like someone is secretly watching you, like on like those websites, websites that we were like talking ads, about, exactly, pop up, or the this very creepy painting that's behind us that's been in our house forever. Which painting? This one. He's watching oh, yeah. us. Right. Exactly. And some of the most advanced software is getting too close for comfort. It's watching us like a hawk. Or even more uncomfortable, that little camera on your laptop that can be hacked. I mean, someone could just switch on your camera and watch you without the green light turning on. And the connection here is that they both raise uncertainty about awareness. Is something aware of me or not? Exactly. The uncanny describes our awareness of awareness. So why are we drawn to things that give us that creepy feeling? Because uncanny experiences sharpen our perceptions. It goes back to when we were hunters. When we were out in the savanna, it was all like, am I about to be haunched on and killed? Haunched <laughs> on? <laughs> haunched, like somebody gonna come get me and kill me. Right, which triggers our fight or flight instincts. Is this predator dead or just sleeping? So it's rooted in the amygdala, the part of our brain that reacts to danger. That's right. The uncanny reflex is deeply rooted in our brains and bodies. This was especially popular in the 18th century, the golden age of automata, when machines began to move like humans. And wasn't that around the time that gothic writers started exploring this theme in books like Frankenstein, the natural versus the artificial? Right. And in 1919, Sigmund Freud wrote an essay called The Uncanny. He describes an old folktale where an evil magician threatens to steal a little boy's eyeballs, which is very creepy. Because eyes are that crucial thing for knowing if something is real. And that brings up this concept of the uncanny valley. It's a function that describes how we react to things as they become more human-like. They become more likable, up to a point. Then there's this transition where things are too similar, too close for comfort, where they fall into the uncanny valley. The unknown, the mysterious. The unexplainable. And this is a danger zone for designers and animators, because they need to avoid making things too lifelike, because that can backfire and make people uncomfortable. What about the other side of the graph? On the other side of the valley are the real humans. Which we like. Right. And if humans become too robotic, they can fall into the valley too. Like if someone's had too much Botox and suddenly their facial expressions don't move in the right way near their eyes. Right. So the key is to not make robots too human-like and not make humans too robot-like. And that's precisely what technologists wrestle with. And what Freud talked about with the eyes. Yes, which is why a perfect example of something that triggers the uncanny reflex is Google Glass. No, not that guy. That guy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Google Glass triggers both types of uncanny responses our confusion about things not looking quite human, and our fears of surveillance. You might say it's the uncanny double whammy. So in today's technological jungle, are we always going to be on that edge of the valley? Definitely. Our technologies will be increasingly lifelike. Sigmund Freud saw this coming. He predicted that the uncanny reflex will be increasingly important to sharpen our awareness and keep technologies like robots, Botox, Google Glass, and whatever comes next from getting too close for comfort. All right, thank you very much.